So uh, last time we were together, we had just finished this wonky discussion of time and temporality and Bart's understanding of the end of time. Uh, we were saying that there is a new, we have a new relationship to time as Christians, one which involves a reciprocal relationship between the past, the present, and the future, which are no longer separate, discrete um, elements of kind of, of, a, of an experience of temporality. It's no longer uh, that we lose the present as soon as we experience it and it disappears into the past and the future is always ahead of us as a kind of foreboding unknown something or other. Um, it is rather that our past is always the past of Jesus. It is always what God has done in and through him. It is always his birth, his death, and his resurrection. And our future is always Jesus. It is the effects of Jesus's birth, death, and resurrection. It is the uh, becoming manifest and apparent and clear what has already been done for us in the past, so that our present is the present experience of both of these things, that is the experience of Jesus Christ and everything that he has done for us. Um, everything between Jesus's death and resurrection and the 40 days after his resurrection and his ascension into heaven is understood by Bart as the end time, as the eschaton. We're not waiting for the end times to take place. If you asked Paul Bart, are we living in the end times? He would say, yes, we've been living in them ever since the year 33 AD. Uh, what he means by the end time is that we live after Jesus' death and resurrection. We live after everything has been finished. Um, we live after God has decisively reconciled the world to himself. All that is left is for this to become fully manifest, apparent, and clear to everyone. And that's what it means to live in the end time. There will eventually be an end of time for Bart. He seems to assume that the linear timeline of the world will eventually come to an end, and that at this end, right, everything will become apparent. We talked about, um, last time we spoke about uh, those, that passage from scripture where it says that the son of man the son of man's coming will be like a flash of lightning which illuminates the whole sky all at once did you find that page yet justin uh, I, have, I have it do you have it no <laughs> but i like that i want to underline that it's, i don't um, find it yet either I mean, it, all right. It'll just don't worry it. about it. Yeah. No, no, it'll 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 just take a moment. It would be good to um. I think I underlined it already, but I can't find it now. Huh. Yeah. I can never find the quotes that I want to find, but then I find something I don't want to find. Right. Um. Was it in chapter 20? I thought that it was. Me too. Ah, here we are, page 133. Uh, in the paragraph on the bottom of the page, the New Testament says of this, I mean, that he will come on the clouds of heaven with the great yeah. power and glory, and as the lightning goeth out from the east to the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay. Um, it down here, uh, him we are expecting, he is coming, and he will be manifest as the one who mm -hmm. we know already. It has all taken place. The only thing wanting is that the covering be removed and all may see it. And this is, again, about this redeemed relationship of past, present, and future, right? So whatever's coming in the future is going to be the revelation. It's going to be the, 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 the becoming apparent to everyone always and forever of what Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us in the past. Um, so that we are no longer like the angel of history we discussed last time in um, that painting by Paul Klee, which Walter Benjamin um, 
uses to describe our relation, the human relationship to, to history, where the angel of history's back is turned towards the future and is being pushed into the future, but with you know, it's unable to see where it's going. But we know exactly where we're going. We're going where we've always been, actually, uh, and where we are right now, which is we're going to the cross and the empty tomb. Um, we are living out of the forgiveness of sin, which is where we're going to end today. Um, so, in these final chapters of the book, Bart is in a hurry. Uh, he says at the beginning of chapter two, our lecture hours are numbered. <laughs> and so he's reaching the end of the semester like we are today. And just as, um, you know, I've had to cancel a class because I was ill, uh, which means that we have more chapters to do today than I'd originally scheduled. So also, I would imagine Bart was getting to the end of the semester. And as always happens, he had to rush through some things, which he um, had a bit at the beginning of the semester. He would have luxuriated in a bit more. Uh, like I said last time, it was really necessary to have all those chapters about faith or that chapter on dogmatics. Did he have to be quite so um, grandiloquent and loquacious when he, he was discussing that stuff? I kind of wish he had more space to discuss the Holy Spirit, certainly the life of the world to come. Uh, but in any case, he is in a hurry here because he's at the end of he's at the end of the term. So uh, we will we will though try to make sense of, of what remains here because it is quite. Um, his understanding of the Holy Ghost, his understanding of the Holy Spirit, is that the, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. It is the Spirit which is eternally breathed forth by the Father and the Son. The Spirit is most crucially the Spirit of Jesus, which we continue to experience today. The spirit of Jesus, which continues to be active and present in our lives and in our world today. It says, let's see if I can find it. At the top of page 137 in his summary paragraph, in this giving and gift, God is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So he's not reducing God to the, he's not reducing God, the Holy Spirit to just God, whenever God gives. Um, he's not saying that God being a spirit is a, um, just a kind of, action which God performs, and we personify this action, this gift-giving, um, as the Holy Spirit. He's rather saying the, the Holy Spirit has an eternal being, is something distinct from the Father and the Son, but that this distinct something from the Father and the Son is still at work in our world, so that whenever we experience God giving to us today, what we're experiencing is God the Holy Spirit. Um, the spirit is the God of whom we have experience now in our lives. That's the easiest way I can summarize it. Um, he draws a distinction here between people who have experienced the spirit in this life and people who have not. Um, this is at the top of page 138. He says there is a general connection of all men with Christ, and every man is his brother. He died for all men, man and rose for all men. And every man is the addressee of the work of Jesus Christ. Um, I just, we'll just put stick right around um, these um, gender non-inclusive um, terms here. And by many means humans. Um, it's just the um, right. It's just the convention of the time in the English translation, but of course he means, he means women and uh, all human beings of any gender identity, period. Uh, but this is the sense in which, as we discussed many weeks ago, Jesus contains within himself all of humankind somehow. Um, he is the embodiment of all humanity. Somehow all of humanity is present in him. This is one of the ways that his death and resurrection works. We somehow all died in 33. Um, this is true always and forever, period, regardless of whether 
one has this additional relationship with God via the Holy Spirit in this life or not. There's a general connection of everybody with Jesus, but then there's a special connection, he says. When we speak of the Holy Spirit, let us look not at all men, he says in the next paragraph, but at special men belonging in a special way to Jesus Christ. When we speak of the Holy Spirit, we have to do with the men who belong to Jesus Christ in the special way that they have the freedom to recognize his word, his work, his message in a definite way, and also to hope on their part for the best for all men. Mm. So <clears throat> this is in uh in my understanding, what he's saying is that there are people, or assume he means the people in this room, though certainly not just the five of us, uh, and, the, and the one of us who is on Zoom, uh, but um, certainly the people in this room. We who have known God the Holy Spirit have this conscious, active, vivid relationship with Jesus in this life right now. Every human being has this general relationship with Jesus, so far as Jesus somehow contains all of humanity. But those of us who are in what we can call the church have this special relationship with Jesus that is a conscious, vivid, living one right now. We're not waiting for the end of time and for the Son of Man to come like lightning, which will light up the night from the east to the west in order to realize what God has done for us. We already have this ongoing, vital, life-giving relationship right now with Jesus. This is that special connection. So he's not saying special men belonging in a special way to Jesus. He's not just referring to, you know, the saints here in the, um, uh, you know, in the, in the restricted sense. He's not just talking about um, you know, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, John of the Cross, that kind of thing. He, he's, he's talking about all of us. But he's saying that the Holy Spirit being active in your life is not something with which every human being is born. It's not a natural condition. Every human being has a kind of general relationship to Jesus, which is just a feature of their human being. It's with that that they are born. But there is a something else. There is a something. There's a something else. Um, and this is, this is a kind of conscious belonging to Jesus Christ. And this conscious belonging to Jesus Christ sets us free, he says, um, gives us freedom from several things, namely freedom from. The, I would say the 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 actual and the perceived or experienced paralysis of being caught in our sin, and it frees us for a certain joyful, confident life here and now, and that freedom. Bart is saying is just not enjoyed by every single human being on this earth before they die. It does not mean that it is not destined for them in the long term. Mm -hmm. It's just saying that there is a something which is particular to people who, who have, to whom the Holy Spirit is given and active in their lives in this life. This, this seems like such a difficult concept because yeah. <laughs> it, it's freedom to live in a certain way yeah. and there's a big constraint attached to that yes it's not um it's also illuminating though yeah say more about how it's illuminating dear just <laughs> to make you do that last week. <laughs> I, well i i'm very big on hope and faith and i feel that what we're discussing and following as um bart is saying for those of us that have been doing it maybe for whatever period of time, 
I, I find it illuminating and strengthening. I mean, there's lots of adjectives I could use. Yes. Um, and I agree that it doesn't mean that people that I know who don't participate in activities the way I may, it doesn't mean that um, that they someday will not feel the same or that in their hearts they do. They, I just feel lucky that, you know, I've been able to experience in my life what I have. Right. Yep. Bart is trying not to turn people into Christians against their will. Right. <laughs> um, and that's what I like about him, Justin. You know, you do like that. It's not do or it's not my way or the highway. Yeah. 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 There I know. Uh, he is both trying to say everybody is eventually destined to enjoy yeah. the good of God's own life forever in Jesus yeah. Christ. But he is, um, I think he tries to leave room for the authenticity of your experience in this life, where not everybody not everybody feels a conscious connection to Jesus Christ through the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he says um, on page 138 in the third paragraph, freedom, which is what the Spirit of the Lord is. When you have the Spirit, you are set free. So he's referring here to the presence of the Spirit. Freedom is not a matter of course, and it's yep. not simply a predicate of human existence. All men are destined to freedom, but not all are in this freedom. And we might clarify that by saying not all are in this freedom yeah. yet. They're not all in this freedom now. Yep. Um, where the line, this is, that's the first caveat, is that we're all destined for it. It's guaranteed, and everybody has somehow has this general connection to Jesus. But then there's this particular special relationship to Jesus through the Holy Spirit where it is conscious and you are set free. Uh, and this is everybody's destined for that, but not everybody currently experiences it. That's the first caveat. The second caveat is where the line of separation runs is hidden from us men. The Spirit bloweth where he listeth. So he doesn't want to say that just the church has it either, right? He wants to, I think, um, allow for... He wants he does he doesn't want to turn people into anonymous Christians, uh, which is one modern uh, one modern solution to the problem of religious difference. Right? It's basically to say that um, all the Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Jains, uh, Zoroastrians from the from the ancient world, right? Everybody secretly having an experience of Jesus Christ. They just don't know it. Mm -hmm. You think you're connecting to God through the you know uh through um you think you're experiencing god by following uh the the, the dharma or the wisdom of the buddha but you're actually you're you're mistaken it's actually the grace of jesus christ that is that is at work in your life and you just don't know it yet he doesn't want to do that he still wants to say that everybody does have a connection to jesus in this kind of general way but that there is a discrete, authentic kind of special connection to Jesus, which is possible, which is not, um, uh, which which is in addition to that. And then he wants to say that um, you cannot draw clear lines ahead of time and predict ahead of time who has that relationship and who doesn't. I think that for Bart, he's going to assume that the church is populated by people who, in fact, do not have that special relationship. And that there are people who have that special relationship with Christ through the Holy Spirit who do not actually go to church. So just going to church and not going to church isn't a guarantee of anything for Bart, right? Well, it is a guarantee of some things, but it's not a guarantee that you have this special relationship or you don't. Um, he's, I, I think he's really, he, he's really where, where you are, Eleanor, which is um, a kind of humility, um, which says, I am fortunate to have this freedom in a conscious way in my life right now. I believe the best for all people. Um, one part of which is that everyone right. will enjoy this freedom in the end, but I do not need for everybody to be on my way right now. Yeah. Um, and God created respect. all of us. I've always felt this way growing up as I just discussed with these ladies in New York. Yeah. Um, I was I grew up around many different people and I feel God made all of us 
uh, whether you're a Buddhist or whatever. And he did that on purpose because he wants, he wants everyone. He, he, you know, I'm no, no more special because I was a Christian to me than my Jewish friends or any other people that I knew that I grew up with. Yeah. Um, God, and they believe that God made them too. And he, our job is to try to get along and deal with each other and, mm-hmm. and follow. That's our job. That's our God given job to me. Yeah. And Bart- Otherwise, he would have made us all dark haired, brown eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes. And he, <laughs> he did that on purpose. He's testing us. Yeah. 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 Um, Different, even in his day. Yeah. And we shouldn't misunderstand um, Bart's use of the word special here in the English translation for being like, oh, you're, you know, you're particularly great. Elect. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we should always remember that the only person who's really elect is Jesus. And we're all elect in him. And we've also all, uh, we, we've all been reprobate in him too. Uh, and so a, a word about that. Um, let's go to page, let's get to the forgiveness of sins in chapter 23 and we'll come back to the church. Um, in 23, what Bart is saying is that the, when we look back on our life, it doesn't matter how old, we are whenever we look back on the history of the world wherever it is that we may be on that history whenever we look back period what we see is the fact that we have already died in jesus and we do not have to die that death ever again he did it for us on our behalf somehow we all did it in him we do not have to do it again it is over. It's done with. All that is to say, anything we look back on, whenever we look back, it's all the forgiveness of sins. That's it. We just look back and we just see that we are forgiven. We don't see a whole laundry list of, well, sometimes I was good, sometimes it was bad. We don't see a laundry list of all of the regrets that we have in life. What we look back on is the fact that we are forgiven. We're always looking back on this wonky non-timeline to what happened in 33, which is both our past, our present, and our future. Um, He says that on the top of page 150, what in retrospect we know about ourselves can always be only that we live by forgiveness. Unpacking what it means to live by forgiveness it's it's an incredibly rich and full thing that he's talking about here. Uh, this goes to the kind of freedom, uh, Connie, which you were you were um, raising a moment ago, which is a complicated kind of freedom. It's not freedom necessarily in the American sense. Um, the freedom in a liberal um, in a liberal in the technical sense, in a liberal democratic polity, is freedom from encroachment or constraint. Um, it's a negative form of freedom, um, sometimes called libertarian freedom. Again, libertarian in the in the technical sense. It's freedom from things. It's liberty in the technical sense. What liberty means is liberty is a kind of freedom um, from constraint. It means that I I have the ability. Well, it means that I don't have any shackles on me. There's nothing that's weighing me down and preventing me from acting and moving in one way or another. There's an additional kind of freedom which Christians are preoccupied with, which is not freedom from constraints. It's freedom for certain things. It's a kind of positive freedom. Um, They would say the Christians are always pointing up the fact that, yes, you need liberty. Liberty is a form of freedom. There are things you are free from, for Bart. There are shackles which have been removed from you, but in order to move forward, you don't just need for your shackles to be taken off. You need the ability for your muscles actually to move you forward, and that's freedom for something. You are free for that thing. I am not free to fly in the positive sense, even though I am free to fly in the negative sense. There's nothing, I mean, the U.S. government has done nothing to prevent me from, or there's nothing else in all of creation that prevents me exactly from um you know from taking off uh from jumping off of this table and then soaring um what prevents me from doing it is that i don't have the freedom to do it so far as it's not a i don't have the capacity or the ability as a human being to fly i don't have wings i can't do that 
Um, it's okay. So what Bart and other Christians are always saying, okay, yes, you need free from sin, but you also need to be free. Being freed from sin means both being released from constraint, but it also means um, it means give, being given spiritual wings so you can fly. Um, for Bart, it means doing things which are good. Uh, he says that um, when you look back on your life, you see the forgiveness of sins. Um, but you also see that if, if there was something else than sin in my life, it was always the thing that came from above. It was always something which was given to me by God. All of the good that we do as human beings is because of God's grace. It's from God's grace. Uh, we were built as human beings to be needy uh, in a way, to, be, to need God and to need God's grace. And um, any good that we do comes about because of grace. Not because we woke up one morning and decided, hey, I think I'm going to be good today. It's because God has freed us from sin and freed us for goodness. And so any good thing comes from above, to use his, um, his metaphor there of height and depth. Um, he has a really very helpful, I think, um, explanation of some of this. You look back stuff what was happening in 33 um pretty helpful explanation actually of the chapters on reconciliation on the atonement that we spoke about on page 151 where he's discussing justification so um here i'm going to move quite quickly um we could spend three hours before or an entire class on justification what it means uh in the writings of the apostle paul um I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a very um, uh, dense definition of justification here, um, in the hopes that with the recording's help, you can unpack it later. We can have a future class or more conversation. Or we can have coffee and I can talk more about it. Um, there are two kinds of talk about justification in the Christian tradition. One is associated with Catholics and one is associated with Protestants. Um, the Catholic understanding of justification means to be made just. That's what it means to be justified. It means to become just by the grace of God. Um, justification is a process that takes your entire life it can even be a process that extends into eternity. Uh, it is justification refers to the fact that at the by the end of things, you will, by God's grace, end up being good. You'll end up being good. And then you will receive eternal life because you have, in some sense, merited that eternal life. It's all done by grace. You're not good on your own. Any good that you do, both Catholics and Protestants are agreed, any good that any human being does is because of God. It's because of God's grace at work in their life. It's not because of the human being's special ingenuity or the human being working on their on, on uh, using only their own powers. It's always, the goodness is always God's. But justification in the Catholic sense means it refers to this lifelong, potentially even eternity uh, extended process of becoming just. For a Protestant, Justification is something which is distinct from that lifelong extended process of becoming holy. Justification means that you and God are good, regardless of whether you are sanctified or not. But regardless of how much progress you've made in your own life, you and God are good. So Protestants, the intervention that is made in the 16th century is to distinguish justification from something called sanctification. And it's that distinction itself that does all of the work, to say that justification is something different than becoming holy. So in the Catholic understanding, justification means it refers to this lifelong process of becoming holy. For Protestants, justification refers to a kind of one and done, you and God are good. And then after that, sure, you can become holy. But becoming holy is something totally different than you and God being good. So for Bart, what it means for you and God to be good is what happened on th in 33. 
in Jesus' death and his resurrection. That's when you and God are good. That's when good, that's when that's when the whole world, all of humankind, all of creation and God are good. Um, you live out of that forgiveness, and that's your sanctification, right? He 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 doesn't he doesn't say it's impossible for human beings to do great things. Um, this is one of the things that we are freed for. Um, he says on page 152. It is precisely when we are aware that God is for me that we are in the true sense responsible for. From that standpoint and from that alone, is there a real ethic? Have we a criterion of good and evil? So living by forgiveness is never by any means passivity, but Christian living in full activity, um, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So he thinks you can do, you are you are free as a Christian to do, to do, to do, to do good works. Okay. Um, but doing the good works is something totally different from your justification. That has nothing to do with whether you and God are okay or not. You and God being okay is all about what God did for you in Jesus. And in some sense, what you underwent yourself in Jesus. Um, so he has two different ways that I found helpful here. One is the temporal. It's the, um, is this looking back metaphor, and then the second is a is the metaphor of um, uh, a teacher helping a student with an assignment. So both are on page one fifty one, um, where Bart says the forgiveness of sins rests on the fact that this dying took place at that time on Golgotha. Baptism tells you that that death was also your death, and so any death that you needed to die to sin, any 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 um, the demands of justice. Regarding your sin, it was all done for you in Jesus, and somehow you did it in Jesus. Somehow you died the death that you were required to die to meet the demands of justice on Golgotha in 33. So you look back on that, and you're like, okay, great, that's done. Um, that's one metaphor. And one of the reasons why I find that helpful is because it, um, the idea that this dying took place um, our dying took place at that time on Golgotha it speaks to the fact that um, this this um, this paradox in Bart where Jesus dies on our behalf and in our place and also somehow we all somehow Jesus dies on our behalf and in our place so far as Jesus contains all of us so far as Jesus contains all of humanity so we're undergoing all of this stuff with and in Jesus as Jesus is doing it um, in any case that's, that's one reason why I find that paragraph clarifying the other is um, is in the next paragraph, where he says, we may think of this as a child drawing an object who does not succeed with it. <laughs> then the teacher sits down in the child's place and draws the same object. The child stands beside him and just looks on as the teacher makes the fine drawing in his own exercise book. Mm. This is justification, God accomplishing in our place that which we cannot accomplish. Um, <clears throat> there's a um, uh, there's a theologian who's um, beloved by the great Episcopal preacher Fleming Rutledge named Leslie Newbingen. I think I'm saying his name correctly. Um, who has a a nice way of summarizing this? It's um, it's something. Like what Christianity is, is it is the simultaneous realization that we cannot do it ourselves and that it has already been done for us. Hmm. You have to, if those two realizations come at the same time. It's, it's, um, that simplifies it's, it. It does. It's law and gospel at the same time. Wow. It's, um, you, you realize, oh gosh, I can't do it. But in that moment, somehow you realize, oh my gosh, I can't do it. In the very moment you see it has already been done for you. Hmm. And that's what it means to live out of the forgiveness of sins. That's what, Bart means when he says, whenever we look back on our lives, all we see is forgiveness, and then we live out of that. We live in the freedom of that. Um, okay, so uh, let's say a word just briefly about the resurrection of the body, and then I'll uh, come back to um, come back to the church. So, Bart, this is one of the places where I actually have a disagreement with Bart. I can't believe. I mean, it's utter hubris to think that I can 
disagree with Bart, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> Bart is really concerned that we don't turn the life of the world to come into just another version of this life. Mm -hmm. um, he thinks that that devalues this life. It somehow makes this life less precious and meaningful. Um, he also, Bart thinks that death, we talked about this a little bit in the creation section, I think. Um, he thinks that death is in a certain sense intended by God in creation, that it is a good thing. It is a mark of our creatureliness. It's a mark of the fact that we are not God, that our lives are limited, that they have a beginning and they have an end. Um, that they don't go on forever. God life goes on forever, but ours does not. And that, that's actually a good thing. Um, now, he distinguishes between death and what he calls real death. Real death is a function of das nictica. It's the result of the fall. Real death is, um, as he says on the top of 154, um, death sets its seal upon the whole. It is the wages of sin. The account is closed. Coffin and corruption are the last word. The contest is decided and decided against us. That's real death. Um, it is both the account being closed and the coffin and corruption being the last word. So it's the idea that there is no completion to this life. Your life is incomplete, actually. So there's death is incompletion. Death is the interruption of your life rather than its fulfillment, its consummation, rather than coming to the end of the book. Mm. And the book wraps everything up and the plot is neatly, neatly ended. Um, Bart is fine with the book having an ending. He thinks the book should end, and that's God's intention and creation. In that sense, in the sense that the book of our lives has an ending, um, he thinks that death is a natural good. It's part of God's original intent. But the problem with death now is that we don't ever get to the end of the book. We It's just cut off in the middle. Somehow we're all cut off before the end of the story, before the end of the story of our lives. So that's, uh, that's the first bit. The account is closed, and the coffin is the last word. And then he says the contest is decided and decided against us. And so it's this idea that our lives are interrupted. And if left to our own devices, um, our lives didn't turn out to be very good. <laughs> uh, short of, you know, if we, if we can't look back on the forgiveness of sin, uh, if, we, if we take Jesus out of the equation, then our lives are interrupted. We don't make it to the end of the story. And the book has been a pretty bad one. Um, so he thinks that... Um, what the resurrection of the dead is, is it is the reaching the actual end of the book of our lives and the end is a happy one. Um, so he says that body, in the sense of the resurrection of the body, refers to the whole human being. That's what it means. And it says that resurrection, he says, um, resurrection means not the continuation of this life, but life's completion to this Man, a yes is spoken, which the shadow of death cannot touch. We rise again. We shall be changed, which does not mean that a quite different life begins, but that this incorruptible, or this corruptible, excuse me, was put on incorruption in this mortal, put on immortality. So the Christian hope affects our whole life. This life of ours will be completed. Um, Christian hope does not lead us away from this life. It is rather the uncovering of the truth in which God sees our life is the conquest of death, but not a flight into the beyond. Um, it is as though when we die, the lightning of the Son of Man flashes upon the whole world. It becomes readily apparent in the relationship of our life to the life of Jesus, the fact that the only thing we have to look back on is the forgiveness of our sins. And the only thing we have to look forward to is closer communion with Jesus. This becomes readily apparent. And that is the happy ending to all of our stories. And so what happens after that? Very unclear, right? Bart wants to insist it's not an extension of this life. It's not another life. It's not, it's not more time. I don't know why it's necessary to say that, especially given the fact he has this cool redeemed form of time. Why can't this? Why can't there be this form of time in eternity? Why can't there be a kind of life and liveliness 
to the life of the world to come. I mean, the scriptures seem to suggest that the life of the world to come is quite vivid. Um, it describes it as a wedding banquet is one metaphor. Um, in the book of Revelation, there's the descent of the new Jerusalem. Um, there's worship and praise in heaven. It's, um, you know, I, 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 I've never been to heaven and come back. I can't tell you exactly what it's like, right? But I think that Bart is potentially selling heaven short. Um, I, he seems to suggest that there's a cessation of time, and so there's no more development, right? I think he really wants for the book to be over, and you've reached the end, and you've closed it, and congratulations, now your life is complete. Perfect. Great. Right. <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I don't, I'll just say it's not clear to me that the book needs to close. I'm not clear that there needs to be an ending to the book of that kind. Um, I think that we, um, when we reach the end of novels, we have a, especially, um, you can think of the marriage plot, for example. We have a very poor imagination for what a marriage actually consists in. A marriage plot works, the novel works, because you have dramatic tension, which is the couple needs to get together, right? And so Darcy and Elizabeth in Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen need to go through all of the rigmarole of their courtship, right? You, you know, Elizabeth needs to feel offended by Darcy. Darcy needs to feel offended by Elizabeth. You need that. If you, if you don't have the tension, then you lose the interest. Um, you need this tension to generate the drama, which keeps you turning the page. And you resolve the drama in the tension ostensibly by getting married at the end of it. And this is the way Christians have imagined the story of the universe, right? It ends with a wedding banquet and the marriage of God and creation, the marriage of Jesus and the church and so on. Um, but any of us who have been married know marriage has its own tensions. <laughs> a marriage, has, marriage has its own interesting bits to it, right? You don't have to end the, just because you, I mean, yes, it can end with the wedding. And the wedding, in some sense, guarantees, the wedding between God and the world somehow guarantees the goodness of everything that is to come. The end is no longer under any, I mean, Bart would say the end is not uncertain now because it all was fixed in 33. But I think that you can get what Bart wants, which is to say, the plot of our lives has reached a conclusion of some kind, a definitive conclusion. But just because it reaches the conclusion doesn't mean that there can't be more after that. It doesn't mean that the conclusion can't unfold and unfurl in ways that are still dramatic and lively and interesting. Um, and I would use the marriage analogy, right? Just because you, you know, yeah, yeah, you get married. And from that point on, guess what? You're married. Your life has reached a definitive conclusion of a kind. But there's still more. There's still, there's still more. There's still more. Um, that was that's that's the um, that's the quibble that I have with Bart. I understand why he wants to do this. I understand he wants he doesn't want to devalue the preciousness of this particular life. Um, but I I don't I don't think that the book needs to end. I would say that the book can reach a plot conclusion which is definitive, but still continue. I tend to think that there is some kind of time in eternity, and that it's like this time. It's a redeemed time. It's not time as we currently experience it. But there is a timefulness to eternity. And that eternal life is just that. It is living. Eternal life is really living um, in a redeemed creation, um, which is no longer afflicted by sin and death. And I don't know what that life would be. It's very hard for me to imagine it. But I don't think it is less than this life. I think it's still life. Mm. I really underline the life bit of eternal life. Mm. Um, so, you know, when, when I had somebody who, um, who asked me... Um, recently in my office, do you think that my loved one is playing tennis in heaven? And I said, heaven must at least be that good. <laughs> must be at least as good as your loved one playing tennis. Right? <laughs> um, so finally, the church. Um, what does he mean when he says at the end of time or the end of the world, God will be all in all? <laughs> yes, so I think he's referring to... Um, uh, when the lightning flashes and okay. this kind of this revelation that the secret to the universe is what happened in 33 and that it's all been taken care of. Um, that's what I think. I think it's the um, the being manifest of what has been true the whole time, but has been hidden from at least some. Yeah, I think that's what it means. God will be all in all. Because um, he doesn't want to say everybody's going to be God or that everything will be divine. Uh, he really thinks that the 
you know, creatures stay creatures and, you know, dogs stay dogs and puppies stay puppies and cats stay cats and human beings stay human beings. We don't all become, um, we don't all become God. Um, so he doesn't mean God will be all in all in that way. And some theologians do say that. Some theologians say we'll kind of be absorbed all into God and we'll all become God and God will be everything. Um, he wants for creation to stay creation, but I think it's just the meaning of creation, God's action in creation. God will be all in all in that sense. Um, the lightning will flash and everyone will see it. Um, so the church, I like his understanding of the church because it is concrete. Um, I have some Anglican quibbles with his theology of the church, but I'm going to leave those aside. Um, part of what I love about the church, his understanding of the church is how practical it is. Um, the church is a congregation. It's St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut, and it's First Presbyterian across the street, and it's the congregational church. Um, he says that when the Holy Spirit arrives, when the Holy Spirit descends upon you, it gathers you into a community. The, the church is a concrete congregation, and it is convened by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what brings people together. It's like the Holy Spirit descends, and the Holy Spirit like puts a magnet inside of you, and then people, people and, and, and you get attracted to them, right? You, you gather. Christians come together. Um, and this is why he says the line about the church always follows, I believe, in the Holy Spirit in both the apostles and the Nicene Creed. So the church always comes under the, the spirit bit. Mm -hmm. So about receiving the spirit that gathers us into a community. By community, he means these communities. He doesn't, he, um, sometimes people draw a very strong distinction between the invisible church and the visible church. Bart doesn't really want to do that. He's all about the visible church. He's like the actual congregation, you know. Uh, and he says that what's special about these actual congregations is not that these actual congregations are perfect, or particularly ingenious, is that God is at work in them. Um, it says on 143, we believe that in this congregation, the work of the Holy Spirit becomes fulfilled. Um, what it means to believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is to believe that your local congregation is a part of the one church, the one community in which the Holy Spirit is active in this special way. Um, namely that the Spirit is doing all the stuff that we read about in the chapters about faith, right? The Spirit is affecting all this stuff. The Spirit is calling you, is making you aware of your calling, and the Spirit is empowering you to proclaim that to the world, to proclaim uh, the Spirit is empowering you to become aware of what has been done for you in Jesus, and then empowering you to tell the whole world, this is why God has done for us in Jesus. Um, and to believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic churches, to believe that this is true of your local congregation, the congregation in which you live and move. Um, he said that on 144, credo ecclesium, I believe in the church, means that I believe that the congregation to which I belong, in which I have been called to faith and am responsible for my faith, in which I have my service, is the one holy universal church. No lack of beauty, no wrinkle spots in this congregation may lead me astray. So congregation doesn't have to end up being perfect, right? I mean, I love the line from um, uh, somewhere in C.S. Lewis, I can't remember, but C.S. Lewis says, one of the purposes of the church is to put us next to people who annoy us. <laughs> uh, and I uh, really believe in churches that put annoying people beside each other uh, there's so few spaces in our lives left where we're next to people who annoy us and who we don't like and who we don't dis who we who we don't agree with on everything who, who, who don't look perfectly like us who don't act perfectly like us who don't vote perfectly like us i mean the, the, the church is one place where this where this is possible right so as say your church is ever going to be perfect uh that's not what it means to say that your church is uh, part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It just means to say that your particular congregation is a congregation in which God is active and at work. Where people are coming to the knowledge by the power of the Holy Spirit that in Jesus Christ, everything has been done for them. Period. <laughs> they are reconciled with God. Their lives are okay. The world has a happy ending. Their lives have a happy ending. The battle has been won. Yeah, there's still skirmishes going on in the front. But the news has just not, not, not reached them. The game has already been won, even though there are a few more moves to be played. It's all done. 
your congregation is a place where that happens. And I'll just say that is my experience. So you all being here as your priest, I think that this place is one of those places where, as Bart says, all it means to be the church here is just to be um, a place where the, the reality of Jesus has promised that where two or three are gathered, I will be there. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. Uh, it's just a place where that reality is taking root in our world in real time. Um, I believe that parish churches like ours, like First Presbyterian, like like the Congo Church down the street, like Saint Aloysius's, uh, these are these are one of the ways that God saves the world, and that's um, I, I believe that because I've had that experience here. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to walk through this little book with you. Um, I will say that this um, one of the reasons why I felt drawn to this book at this particular moment, why I felt drawn to Bart at this um, particular moment is um, in our history, which we've talked about. We talk about Bart's history, our moment, mm -hmm. how they're the same, how they're different, is on 148, where he's talking about the practical effect of belonging to a community of this kind. Um, thank you that you have hope. Um, and I can't resist just flagging before I do that in like the last 30 seconds of the class. <laughs> this line on page 146 about uh, places where the Bible becomes a dead book with a cross on the cover and guilt edging. Uh, that's a fantastic line. Isn't it? Uh, it's just a fantastic line. Uh, it reminds me of um, things which Bishop Grind, whose class this used to be, would say, you know, he said, if you want for your parish to be alive, you just have to, you have to turn to the scriptures, um, which I think we, we, I have experienced, I'll just put this, I have experienced this in our podcast, as we've grown more deeply into the scriptures, and the scriptures have become less and less and less a book with a cross on it, with a, you know, with guilt edging, but rather a, a living, breathing word in which God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, revealing this good news to us, um, as we discuss it in a community um, with the three amigos and with with all of you who chime in about um, who chime in afterwards, you're like, why didn't you talk about this in your sermon? I love that comment. Um, <laughs> that, that, I think that has been that has been true for me in our in our congregation. Uh, but anyway, I couldn't resist that. It's a great line. But on one forty eight, the reason why I felt drawn to Bart in our moment is this line about hope. Mm. He says the Christian hope, which is the most revolutionary thing we are capable of thinking and beside which all other revolutions are mere blank cartridges, is a disciplined hope. It points man to his limitations. There you may hold out. The kingdom is coming, so you must not begin the flight to the kingdom of God. I love that line. We're not building the kingdom. Bart's very clear about that. You hear this a lot. People are like, let's go build the kingdom of God. And Bart's like, no, that is not it. The kingdom of God is for God to build, and it comes to you. You can rush to meet it, he said, but God's building the kingdom. Uh, and thanks be to God for that. He says, uh, he goes on and says, take your place and be in your place as a true minister, verbi divini, minister of the divine word or the word of God. You can be a revolutionary, but you can also be a conservative. Where this contrast between revolutionary and conservative is united in one person, one man, where he may be at once quite restless and quite at rest. He may be with the others in that way in the congregation which the members recognize each other in longing and in mm. ability in the light of the divine humor, mm. he will do what he has to do. Um, mm. And this combination of Christian hope, many one to be both revolutionary and conservative with regard to the particular times and places we occupy, I think, um, you know, all of which is a function of the fact that for Bart. Everything depends on God and nothing depends on us. It's all about Jesus's authority. It's not about our authority. It's all about the fact that he's won the day, which allows us to hope the best for all people. Um, and it's not up to us. It's simply up to us to be grateful for it and to proclaim it. This way of passing through the chaos of history is what has really, really helped me personally in this season of our life together. Um, mm. in this season. Mm. Brilliant. Justin, thank you. First. Thank you for a wonderful, ah. wonderful class. Lots of lots of things to think about. And a question: What are you going to do for an encore? Oh, gosh. Um, I am going to um, offer a class on um, Bart digested. So, uh, and I mean that as a as a pun. So, there's a um, there's a priest who was well, a priest in Long Island for a very long time. His name is Robert Ferrer Capon. He's not very well known. Um, but I think he was utterly brilliant, 
And he is like Bart digested. He is like, he is, he's somebody whose books read like somebody who has been reading this stuff their whole life. And he has a way of um, huh. making it colloquial and real. Um, and it's just, it's just very, very, very powerful. So this book has been like, this book is the preparation for that. Um, um, you know, this has been, um, and some of it's very intellectually difficult. Um, okay. It is rich and spiritually illuminating, I think, but it can be very intellectually difficult. Robert Perkaven has a way of just, just making it all very clear, very plain, helping you to feel the force. And I've experienced the freedom of Bart's way of thinking by reading Caven. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to read Caven's theological cookbook, uh, which is called The Supper of the Lamb. Wow. So that at the conclusion of that class, we'll have the opportunity to um, uh, to make the lamb recipe together. What a time! Uh, it's all wow. about it's all about his. See, when I talk about he's he's making the Bardian theology real. He it's all like um, let's say the first chapter is a meditation on what it's like to cut an onion open, mm -hmm. and it is one of the most exquisite bits of spiritual writing I've ever read. Wow. Um, so, anyways, so we're going to look at Robert Capon. In, That's um, okay. With the K. With a C. C A P O N. <laughs> and the book's title is The Supper of the Lamb. Mm. I look forward to that. Hope we all like lamb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got the random mass here. Thanks okay. to the, the five of you. We got one on Zoom here uh, who Thank joined you. us for our last class.